Welcome everyone to our Temple of Light service. It's a pleasure to see everyone here and thank you, Robert, for your rousing music. I'm Steve Ventoli here in Atlanta. And uh, just remember, it looks like everybody's muted. So just remember to mute yourself. You can do that on your, your lower left-hand screen of your Zoom screen. And if you're on your phone, you can press star six. Okay, let's greet each other and telling us your name, your location, and who you're with. And we'll begin with our places in Europe and South Africa. So you can unmute yourself to do that. Hi, this is Davina Mizrock calling in from London. Hi, England. Davina. Hi. And Louise Bloomberg from Johannesburg. Hi, Louise. And Arno and Mia and Laura from South Africa in Johannesburg. Welcome. And we'll move over to our Eastern time zone. Carol Smith in Atlanta. Hi, Carol. Millie Holiday in Atlanta. Hi, Millie. And Robert and Terry in Atlanta. Hi, neighbors. <laughs> and this is Bill. And this is Bill. Hi, Bill and Linda. This is Lucille in Mount Airy, North Carolina. Hi, Lucille. Hi. I can't get my picture on there. Uh, you can mute yourself now, though. OK. Gordon McFarland, Burlington, Vermont. Hi, Gordon. Hi. Uh, Brendan McMahon here in Dorset, England. Hi, Brendan. Anyone else Eastern time zone? Okay, we'll move over to the central time zone. <clears throat> Alan Geisinger near Austin, Texas. Hi, everybody. Hi, Alan. And Stosh Jankowski from Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada. Hi, Stosh. And we'll move over to our central time zone or our mountain time zone. Ron Beard and Shirley Malin in Fort Collins. Hi, Ron. Hi, Shirley. Hi. Suzanne Core in Central Colorado. Good morning, everyone. Hi, Suzanne. Robert Merriman in Denver, Colorado. Hi, everybody. Hi, Hi Robert. Joyce Krantz in Fort Collins, Colorado. Hi, Joyce. <clears throat> Luann Sum Summers in Northern Arizona, which is also mountain time. Thank you. Hi, Luann. Tom and Deborah Stars and Joy Erling in Tucson. Hi, Tom and crew. Okay, Pacific time zone. This is Jim Crowner from the beautiful state of Washington near Yelm. Hi, Jim. And John and Pamela, Lake Elsinore, California. Hello. Hi, Tom. Hi, John. Gloria. Mary Kyle in Redmond. Gloria. Hi. Desert. Gloria. Hi. Gloria. Very good. Hello, Stuart Berger in Norwalk, California, near Los Angeles. Hi, nice Stuart. Yeah. Alice Penwell in Las Vegas, Nevada. Hi, Alice. Hi, David and Anne in Salmon Arm, British Columbia. Good morning, all. Good morning. And Laura Fisher in Sun Peaks, British Columbia. Hello, everyone. Hi there. Good morning, Laura. And Jack and Brenda Jenkins in 108 Mile Ranch, BC. Hi, Jack, Brenda. Okay. Uh, anybody right here in Bend? Hi, Daniel. Daniel. All right, Bend. Great. Hi there. Uh, anyone west of the Pacific time zone? And if anybody who's that? 
in Hundred Mile House in the Log Chapel. All right, David. Nice to have you. Thank you. And John? Is that you, John LeBaron? Okay. I think we can see you and I think you're here. Uh, we can hear you. Welcome, John. And you can mute yourself here. I think your line is frozen. Okay. okay. And anyone else who hasn't greeted us yet, you can uh, take a moment right now. Is there anybody else? Yeah, Mary Janik in Denver. Hi, Mary. Okay. Okay. Today, John Gray and Louise Brumberg will be leading our time. And we're going to mute all the lines before they begin. And John, Louise, you can unmute yourself to begin. So over to you both. John. We bring our uh, our untroubled hearts and serene minds with us as we come together now. This place in consciousness where we gather is a holy place. This is the temple of light. Welcome. Forever friend, Louise Bernberg and I have opportunity to co-present this morning from Southern California and this evening from Johannesburg, South Africa. On almost opposite sides of the planet geographically, but both here and now spiritually. We will be sharing the reading of Martin Exner's service of November 25th, 1984, The Accuser Cast Out Forever, and offering some additional words. On the original occasion, Martin referenced a well-known portion of chapter 12 of the book of Revelation, beginning with the seventh verse. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and the dragon fought at his angels. And prevailed not. Neither was their place found anymore in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out. That old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night, and they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto the death. Therefore rejoice ye heavens and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea. For the devil is come down unto you having great wrath because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. Mm -hmm. 
we are together now in this moment in what we have come to recognize by using the word heaven. This is an invisible place, but we are all here present in it, whether we can see each other or not. And so we share this present moment in heaven. Could we describe this heaven in more pertinent earthly terms? How about the emissary ministry, the spiritual body, EDL? Is, th is not this our heaven? Would we have very much practical awareness of a state of at least some oneness in heaven in this moment if it, if it had not been for the emissary ministry, if it had not been for EDL? Here is heaven as we presently experience it. It can easily be described in these terms. If there had been no emissary ministry, could we be having this experience now? Of course not. So for us, in a very practical sense, EDL, the spiritual body, the emissary ministry is our heaven. I might read some rather familiar words from the book of Revelation, which can be seen now in a way that is immediately applicable to what I've just referred to. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and the dragon fought and his angels and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. If we see this particular passage in terms of what we know, namely the emissary ministry, the spiritual body, EDL, then I am sure we are all quite aware that even though Michael and his angels were in the heaven, so also have been the dragon and his angels. Here is the next verse. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which, which accused them before our God day and night. Well, another name for the dragon then is the accuser. This describes very well his character. I'm sure that we are all well aware that the accuser has been in this heaven of the emissary ministry. We're coming down to very specific cases here, a field in which all of us obviously have responsibility. The accuser has not yet been cast out of heaven, but still remains because this attitude of accusation still remains in those who compose what we call the emissary ministry, the spiritual body, EDL. We are all presumably concerned that the dragon and his angels should not prevail. No longer prevailing, they may be cast out of heaven, out of the emissary ministry, out of the spiritual body, out of EDL. All these terms we recognize refer to one thing, one thing to which we ourselves are associated and to which we ourselves have given form. This emissary program would not exist but for us. So we are directly associated with it. If we align ourselves with the accuser, then we condemn ourselves and the accuser continues to prevail in heaven. We recognize that the accuser needs to be cast out of heaven as it relates to the whole of mankind, but it must start somewhere. I, I doubt if it would ever happen on a broad front. Accusation describes the ordinary human state. 
everybody is identified to a considerable extent with the accuser, even in the emissary program. We've heard about this. We've considered it many times. We understand that blame and criticism are not the attitudes rightly held by those who are associated in this program. But nevertheless, the accuser has remained. At times rather big and fat. I do not think any of us expect the accuser to be cast down in a very general sense throughout the human population. Everyone is thoroughly embedded in this human state. However, it can well be said that we know better. We understand the destructiveness of the attitude of accusation, the attitude of blame and criticism. We might expand that a little bit to see what it is about which we are inclined to assume the attitude of accusation, blame and criticism. One could well ask a question, have I ever been hurt? I'm thinking of this particularly as it relates to the emissary ministry. Human beings everywhere very easily identify their hurts and presumably those who were responsible for hurting them. But what about us within the emissary ministry? Have we been subjected, subjected to hurts because of EDL? Because of those or well, other than ourselves, of course, who were associated in giving form to EDL. Have we ever seemed to be abused, victimized, imposed upon? We can add to this list at will, I'm sure. But are these things present in us as reasons for accusation, as reasons for criticism and blame, perhaps in a more or less general sense to EDL? but also more specifically to this person and that person who has been with us associated with EDL in giving it form. This begins to bring something down to cases so that the passage which I read to you may be seen as having immediate and very potent application. Here we are together associated with EDL. We wouldn't be sitting here in the chapel at 100 Mile House or at Four Ways in Johannesburg if this wasn't so, to some degree at least. Here we have the heaven, a heaven which we are sharing in this particular configuration this morning. How about letting the accuser be cast out because we no longer give him space in ourselves as individuals. That is the only way it can be done. It may seem as though there are a number in agreement about some sort of accusation, but for a number to be in agreement about some sort of accusation, the accusation must be being made by all the individuals who compose that grouping. So it is an individual matter. It is an individual choice as whether finally the dragon, the devil, the accuser may be cast out of our heaven, our very specific heaven, the EDL heaven. I've heard EDL spoken of in disparaging terms. That it seems to me would smack of accusation. But what is EDL? Us. It only exists because of us. It isn't anybody else. And each individual can say, it only exists because of me. So here is a very particular requirement, individually speaking, that we might take responsibility for letting the accuser be cast down forever that they may be heaven without the accuser. It isn't much of a heaven as long as the accuser is present. It turns into hell periodically when the accuser asserts himself. We've all had this experience over the years. 
But finally, we come to a, to a point where heavenly dominion must be set in the earth. Heavenly dominion can never be set in the earth until the accuser is cast out. We just fool ourselves if we imagine that we can continue to entertain the accuser. We can always find things to accuse and people to accuse in what heretofore has passed for our heaven. It's a divided state. Yes, Michael and his angels are present. And we do find ourselves identified at times with what is portrayed through these words. Perhaps more particularly when we've gathered in a grouping such as we have today. In this moment, we can see these things more or less clearly. But then there is always the tendency to revert, isn't there? Into the usual human state of accusation by which all the world is deceived. As long as there is accusation, there is deception. There is dishonesty because the human state was produced by human beings, ourselves included, and not by anyone else. Ultimately, of course, in this attitude of accusation, the accusation comes to point with respect to God or with respect to the Lord. He didn't do what is right by human beings. He didn't do what is right by me, particularly. He caused me to be hurt, he caused me to suffer. He caused me to be imposed upon. He caused me to be victimized. You know, in theory at least, that is not true. That is a lie. If we have our troubles as human beings, we brought them on our own head. We may see this and have seen it, as most people have, with respect to masses of human beings on earth. Human beings altogether have brought their troubles on their head. Well, that is something to be recognized, I suppose. It's true. But what is to be done about it? Obviously, someone, somewhere, somehow, needs to emerge out of the state of bringing trouble into the state of blessing rather than cursing. And whether we realized it to start with or not, we have found ourselves in the position of assuming this responsibility. We have found ourselves together doing this. Yes, that's true. But it doesn't mean anything until we find ourselves individually doing it, individually taking very specific responsibility. No more accusation. When the accuser is given no more space in us individually so that we cannot anymore identify with him, then he is cast out in the only way that he ever could be cast out. And if he is cast out in me and in those who assume the same responsibility that I do, then he begins to be cast out collectively. We are provided with this marvelous illustration of, of where it all begins, namely, the emissary ministry, the spiritual body, EDL. This is the heaven insofar as we are concerned. Do you have any other? Do you know where to go to find any other? This is what we know. Let us assume responsibility for our knowing then that the accuser may be cast out. There are all kinds of troubles in the world, tribulations, suffering. We nod our heads sagely and say, yes, human beings bring these things upon themselves. There are those, of course, who have it better than others. 
and I think we might be counted among that number. This has been particularly brought to the attention of the Western world by the suffering of millions of people in certain parts of Africa. Not that suffering is limited to Africa, but at the moment, this is out front. And there are certainly those who are in that sort of a hell, a hell particularly identified at the moment by the word famine. Some people say that that is the fault of the weather. Is the weather, do you think, separate from human beings? Does it have a life all of its own regardless of human beings? Of course, we know better than that. Obviously, if, for instance, you deforest the world, you're going to have a desert. And if you have a desert, it's not going to grow much food. If you pollute the air and the water, it's going to have an effect upon the weather. And deforesting has an effect upon the weather. Everything that human beings do has an effect upon the weather. And where does what human beings do spring from? Out of their own hearts and minds. Out of what should be the heaven. And it does that <coughs> because the accuser is in there. The accuser has some other names as well. I don't think we need to go into that, but we might consider that he does have some other names. So weather is a human responsibility. Do you think the weather which occurs on earth is because of sunspots? This has been a good justification for the weather on the part of the more scientifically inclined rather than face personal responsibility in the matter. That if there is a mess on earth, whether weather wise or in any other way, it is because of human beings. We have found ourselves in that classification, but we have also awakened to something to which most people have not awakened as yet. And that is a realization of personal responsibility. Even though there may have been an awakening to this, at times it has not had all that much effect on the way we behave. But now this is coming to point. Our heaven, and we know what that is now, describable in emissary terms. Our heaven, is in the process of being purged. Obviously, there are two ways this can happen. Either we, we remain identified with the accuser and find ourselves purged out of the heaven, or we accept our identity as one of the angels of Michael so that any tendencies of accusation in us are purged from us and we remain in heaven. <coughs> Here's the starting point of heaven for the whole body of mankind. Here's the focus of it. Look where you will anywhere else on the face of the earth and you will not find a focus of heaven as clear cut and definite and absolute as is to be found in our emissary terms. There are others who are, who are afraid of that clarity, that absoluteness. And so they're inclined to be purged and go shopping around to find something that is quite so definite so that one can still continue to accommodate the accuser. But we see, I'm sure, individually we see that we cannot under any circumstances continue to accommodate the accuser. Do you justify yourself in accusation by saying, well, that's obviously wrong. <clears throat> that person isn't doing what he or she should be doing.
I will tell you something about the past. Everything that has occurred up to this very moment has been absolutely perfect. It has brought all us all to this present moment where we have the opportunity of letting the accuser be cast out. If any smallest element in our experience in the past had been omitted, whether we judged it to be good or bad, who can say as to whether we would be exactly here where we are now? There is nothing wrong in that sense. Whoever behaved, however they did behave, it all worked out to let us, let this come to this point now. Isn't that perfect? How else could it have been done? Then what is the value of judgment, criticism, accusation with respect to things that are happening now? The things that are happening now, oh, they're in the past already. So we are present now, willing, if we have any integrity and intelligence, these seem to go together, to let the accuser be cast down and out forever. Each one must say, I am the one who lets it happen. I do it. Whether anyone else does it is beside the point. But insofar as I'm concerned, I do it. I have, therefore, integrity. I take responsibility. So the heaven is purged and those who find themselves remaining in the heaven have a clarifying awareness of the ordinances of heaven, which couldn't be seen at all as long as the accuser was present. But once the accuser is cast down, the ordinances of heaven become very clear. This doesn't mean that one sees a panorama of the great outworking in the days to come. It merely indicates that in this present moment, we see what it is that is necessary from the heavenly standpoint. We not only see it, but we do it. If we can't see, we can't do it. And we won't see as long as the accuser is clouding the issue. When the accuser is cast down, we see. And where there is vision, the people live. And seeing the ordinances of heaven, we are in immediate position to set the dominion thereof in the earth, that what is present and emerging now may be purely of heaven. Once there is space in human consciousness, the consciousness of mankind, for the unadulterated state of heaven, then the end comes. It is because this has never happened within the body of mankind in a collective sense that the accuser has remained in command. Of course, it was done quite a long time ago by one individual. We acknowledge and recognize that and realize we wouldn't be here but for that. However, it has taken all these centuries for it finally to begin to come to point because there is a heavenly space on earth within which there is understanding, within which the truth becomes known. <coughs> the truth, by the way, presently not only relates to the truth of heaven, but also to the truth of hell. And we begin to see clearly enough the rot and the filthiness that has been sustained by ourselves as individuals in this beautiful heaven that has been so freely offered and made available. We are thinking of this in terms of those who are associated with the emissary heaven, which is our heaven for which we are responsible. 
Can you imagine that those who carry this responsibility could indulge themselves in accusation, condemnation, and criticism of their fellows, <clears throat> doing it day and night? Because that is the human state. That is what happens in the human state. People are doing this all the time, are they not? Certainly it's made very plain in the newscasts on TV, for instance. <clears throat> Everybody lines up, <laughs> one of a crowd, accuse, condemn, blame, criticizes, tear down, destroy, and people wonder why there is war on earth. Oh, let's have peace. But change from being the accuser to being the blesser? That is too much to ask. Is it? We know the way, the truth, and the life. Let us reveal that we know it. Yes, all the things, the miseries, the tribulation on earth are consequent upon the way human beings have behaved. All of it. How is it ever going to be any different? Because there are those people on earth with sufficient integrity to let the accuser be cast out of the heaven which they know. Most people don't know the heaven. They hope for something, sometime, somewhere. But we know the heaven now. Knowing the heaven, how could it be that we would sustain the presence of the accuser in that heaven? I would say it is almost incredible, isn't it? We know these things. Let us let the accuser be cast down forever, that there may be the true heaven on earth. And when the true heaven is on earth, through those who give it form, salvation has come. As it is put here, and I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. That has been our state, hasn't it? That is a very accurate description. Accusation, day and night. That is the quality of the human state. That's the way human beings are. That's the way we have been, but now we know better. We are sufficiently taken care of, shall we say, in the external sense. We have enough to eat. We have, I'm sure, a lot more comforts than we deserve <laughs> so that we may have time to do what is necessary. Where millions of people are in a state of famine or of hunger, of dying in that way, all their energy is simply given to surviving just a little longer. But we have space. We have time. We have opportunity. Because these famine pictures have been put on the TV screen a lot, of, a lot of people in the Western world are feeling very guilty about it. And they dish out a few dollars and send some food as though that was going to solve anything. Maybe it's all right to send some food. But suppose enough food was sent and all those millions of people survived and continued to breed. What's gonna happen next? Something worse. But the, well, I described them as fat cats. That would include us of the world have the time to do something, but they won't do it. They want to do things for their own pleasure. And I have noticed this even in our emissary program. We should have more. We're not being treated as well as some of those people in the world. The Lord's falling down on the job. No, we are falling down on the job. We don't need those things. 
All we need is to be in place in heaven with the accuser cast down. And we need to use the space that we have and find more space to do what should be done so that we are not so preoccupied with our own self-centeredness, the things we think we want or deserve or should have or whatever. We have everything everything that's necessary to allow us to do what we are here to do. Let's do it then. Let us accept integrity for ourselves that we may abide in the heaven as an angel of Michael, as it was described. No more truck with the accuser. To hell with him. That's where he is. That's where he belongs. So I rejoice that today, together, representing East and West, Northern and Southern Hemispheres, we may let this word be spoken in our living clearly and definitely, so that the ordinances of heaven factually are set in the earth. This occurring within the consciousness of mankind, because we're not separate from that. If it happens where it rightly can happen, with us, it will happen throughout the body of mankind with absolute certainty. There is no certainty at all, as long as there is a divided state, as long as the accuser hangs around. At least the only certainty that is death, is death final and complete. So we stand <clears throat> where we belong with our integrity intact, honest and true and loyal and capable, knowing the ordinances of heaven and moment by moment in our living, setting the dominion thereof in the earth. I would provide opportunity at this moment for Rupert at Four Ways to speak a word from that Southern part of the human body. Rupert Maskell. Martin, your words came over loud and strong to us assembled here at Four Ways this evening, your Sunday morning. This is the conclusion of our All Africa Summit meeting that we've been holding here over the weekend. And not surprisingly, the theme of your words this evening <coughs> has been very much the theme of our council considerations. Here we are assembled on the base of this vast continent, where, as you say, many millions of people are facing severe hardship. We recognize that this is just one small part of the suffering that, that is occurring in mankind. We also recognize that we have here, through our agreement in spirit with you and our oneness in spirit with the Lord, the means by which the suffering may come to an end because we inexorably maintain the heaven. The accuser is cast out. A lens is focused in heaven. And all the suffering and fear and the misery, which is so rife everywhere in the world, disintegrates as the darkness before the rising of the light. It is so good to share this absoluteness with you, recognizing <clears throat> that we of this ministry or we who dwell in heaven are the ones who set the tone and lead the way back into the garden where we belong. Thank you for your beautiful words. Mr. Barton concluded, I am most thankful Rupert <clears throat> for your strong and assured words representing as they do <clears throat> the spirit which is moving in the hearts and minds of those who compose the space in heaven we have referred to as the emissary ministry. As there is an absoluteness, which we now understand more clearly than heretofore, perhaps, then this tragic human state may come to its conclusion, because there are those present on earth setting the dominion of the ordinances of heaven in the world. These are those who have integrity. Let each one be able to speak honestly and say, 
I am that one who has integrity. So we share this time together, apparently far distant in miles, but very, very close in spirit, close in heaven. Let that heaven be pure because the accuser has gone. Mm. Oh, thank you, John. Um, apparently far distant in miles, but very, very close in spirit. Close in heaven. Um, I'm certainly feeling that. I happened to be living at Four Ways in Johannesburg at the time that the service was given, and I was in the room um, with Rupert. So this is evoking much for me, and, and I'm feeling in this moment the expansiveness of what we're about that does transcend time and distance and dimension, and here we are together in this moment. And I, what a joy. What a joy. The service evoked lots of thoughts for me. And uh, so just to touch on a few, um, at the time, apparently the famine in Africa was, was up. That was the tribulation. Martin spoke about um, all kinds of tri troubles in the world, tribulation, suffering. Yeah, that was 1984. I mean, pick a year, any year since the beginning of time that there wasn't trials and tribulations and suffering. That's been the nature of the world. In, in an email that David sent us um, recently, he summed it up quite graphically. This is what he said. As the world burns on multiple fronts, fear, hate, violence, racism, pandemic ills, raging wildfires, political chaos, financial inequality, an arrogant entitlement, and more. We can keep going with that. So this, that's the state of the world we find ourselves in, and here we are in this place of heaven. So, and here I am, still in South Africa, still in Johannesburg. I've been lots of other places meantime, but I'm back in Johannesburg. And uh, what's in one's own vicinity seems to loom large. And our, our version of the trials and tribulations recently here in South Africa was an attempted coup a couple of weeks ago. Some of you might have seen the harrowing images of looting and pillaging and massive destruction on, it was broadcast around the world apparently. And it was scary and it was horrific. And, uh, but fortunately it did come under control after within a, within a week, which was pretty amazing. And that was followed by scenes of just the South African spirit and people coming together and cleaning up the streets together, blacks, whites, all religions. It was amazing and acts of heroism and kindness and this upsurge of goodwill and hope and oh yes, you know, we can do this, which is wonderful. And I certainly celebrate that, but it does beg the, beg the question, you know, when there's hope, hope for what, hope for what? that uh, we'll get things back to normal, get big things back to the way they were, that we'll get a better version of human nature in place so we'll all be a little more comfortable. And uh, pretty much that's what people hope for. But, you know, we know that human nature was the problem. And the good human nature, bad human nature, Human nature is fickle and unreliable and untrustworthy. And the only answer is heaven, an orientation in heaven. And we are the answer. We are the answer. Providing, providing that reality of heaven so the call can go out within the range of human experience. Come out of her, my people enough come out of her because we're providing it. And, um, you know, we all heard the call. I know everybody on this call, we heard the call many years ago. So many years, if I can, looking around this group, we have quite a few hundred years amongst us. 
Yeah, and um, we we were the ones who were drawn together into this emissary ministry, the spiritual body, EDL. We were the ones. We were the ones. And uh, we heard the call. And that, that got me thinking about how the call was for me. So just to share a little bit of my experience back along the way. I um, was living in Johannesburg at the time, 1977. I'd known the emissaries for a few months and there was a, a one week class at the farm we had Helena's Flay in the Cape. Um, some of you may know some of this history, it doesn't matter. And so I signed up for the class and I was going for one week to Helena's Flay. Then I was gonna have a holiday in Cape Town. It's close to the Cape and this beautiful um, wine growing valley. Um, so I was driving with a friend of mine who was also going to the one week class. It's about a 12 hour drive from Johannesburg, beautiful drive. And um, we're driving over the mountain. We were having a lovely time driving over the mountain pass. And then she points out Helena's flay um, down below. And I felt this pressure mounting. And uh, I said to her, you know, I'm feeling a little nervous. And she said to me, I'm terrified. <laughs> and we both confess that oh my god this is this is big this is big something we knew that something momentous was about to happen and um we ended up at the hotel having a few beers smoking a few cigarettes just to get the courage to go to helena's play which we obviously did and um and the class was great helena's play was beautiful mia was already living there and um it was a beautiful place and the class was wonderful but it was on that last day of class, the last class, when we heard the recording of Coming Home and that knocked my socks off. That did it for me. I, I remember walking out of that class stunned. You know, um, and, and those words of Martin's, oh, not Martin, Yuronda, what is your quitting point? I don't know if any of you remember this. If you have a quitting point, that is where you cease to be a man or a woman and you become a member of the body of the beast. <laughs> I mean, those words were like branded on my heart on that day. And um, it was a call for an uncompromising commitment. And that's what got to me. It was like, this is it. And I, it was like a defining moment in my life. And I made the commitment there and then. And so of course the holiday to Cape Town got scrapped. I didn't leave Helena's Flay. I went to the Tui class, which was in the following January. And I actually never left. And I just stayed on for the next 20 odd years, not necessarily to Helena's Flay, but at Emory communities or communal homes and, and became a full-time committed member of this emissary program. And kind of in my mind, what, what Yuronda was saying was, don't quit the emissary program. That's how it was interpreted for me. That's because then you cease to be a man or a woman. Then, you know, th that's what was being asked for. Um, you know, and I have no doubt that there was something absolutely right about our commitment and our loyalty to the emissary program along the way. I know for many of us on this call, that was the case where um, absolute commitment, absolute loyalty, absolute obedience was required. And it was the best training imaginable to prepare us for our commission as emissaries of divine light you know, as part of Michael's angels. And, you know, as Martin said, I'll tell you something about the past. Every, he said in the service, everything that has occurred up to this very moment has been absolutely perfect. It brought us to this present moment. But 
there came a time when things changed in the organizational aspect of the emissary program that I wasn't sure what I was being loyal to anymore. Something had shifted and uh, my proximity changed. You know, I had a little more distance. And um, I've since listened again to coming home. And here's what Yoronda actually said. What he actually said was, what is your quitting point? The point where sacred things are not worth it anymore. Let him go smash, he said. <laughs> that is the point he sees to be a man or a woman and become a member of the body of the beast. The quitting point is where sacred things are not held sacred. And that was the point. That was the point. He was talking in the context of honoring heavenly mother and father, which is love and truth. So if there is accusation, blame and criticism, what are you doing? You're trampling on sacred things. They can't, they can't exist in love. And if you have judgments about how things should be, you are dishonoring truth and that's trampling on sacred things. So that, so then I, I realized that I never let go of that original covenant I made at Kalina's play to honor my heavenly father and mother to keep sacred things sacred. And I think that's true of all of us. That's why we're here. Yeah. It is a collective experience, but as Martin emphasized, it has to be personal first. It has to be individual. And uh, yeah, that was my experience. Oh. And just to close my time, I just want to say a word about my earthly father, Harold Brumberg. And as some of you here know him, knew him, he wrote me a letter in 1978. And I'd like to read a portion of this letter. Here's what he said. You must surely be aware of my daily thanksgiving prayers for your emergence into the realm of light and reality. I can't begin to tell you how excited I am by what is happening to you and others like you. It is because of what you are becoming that I know, capital letters underlined, I know that there is hope for the world. It was a handwritten letter in <laughs> that old, um, the present moment of awareness, which means the ever present moment is the most exciting and important that you will ever know. Having set your compass bearing, just stay on course through all weathers and conditions. Things really are working out perfectly. And uh, just to give a little context, I'll just read a little bit more, but to give some context here, this was 1978. We lived in what was then Rhodesia, later became Zimbabwe. And we had a hotel in a farming community in the bush. And there was a bush war happening. And the, the, this was kind of the last years of the bush war. And uh, the farms were under attack, everybody was, under the threat of attack at any time. And um, stock theft was a big thing. And this is the context. So I'm gonna read a little bit more of what he says. Coming now to the world of effects and in particular, the Guai Valley. Our hotel was the Guai River Hotel. Things are pretty tense. The farmers are losing cat lots of cattle and in consequence, losing heart too. Should things continue along these lines, probabilities are that they, the farmers, will be offered alternative land in less sensitive areas or be paid out and this long narrow strip of land will revert to tribal land. This latter idea incidentally makes a lot of sense. 
However, everyone still continues to gather at the Gwai to unwind and sleep easily. I don't have to relate my own views on the sequence of events here, and for that matter, everywhere else. I see only a cleansing process going on, a breaking down of conditions which have kept our fellow men entombed for so long. The disintegration is nothing more than a breaking down of a scab encrustation on the body. So that was my father who never attended an emissary class, who never lived in an emissary community. And for the 60 years I knew him was one of the most clear, unwavering emissaries of divine light I had ever known. And so, you know, for me, it's an example that the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ is not confined to organization necessarily. He, he did meet Martin when Martin came to South Africa and, and many others, I know John and Pamela were amongst them. And he had a great love for the, the people and the emissary program and a great respect. And um, it just feels good to honor him today and to honor all those who have gone before and brought us to this point where we can be here today doing what we're doing. And so I offer profound and eternal thankfulness. And I include John Gray in that. Over to you, John. Thank you, Louisa. I was uh, privileged to know your father briefly. The heaven that we maintain is not locational and it's not temporal. It is beyond dimensional in that sense, but it is here and now. As you mentioned, Louise, as you were heading off to that one week seminar, something momentous is happening. We tend to be mostly aware of it when it is affecting us personally. Go, oh my gosh, look at this. And, but something momentous in capital letters is happening now. <clears throat> we recognize that it wasn't uh, Jesus's intention to initiate Christian religions, <clears throat> but to inspire and, and lead people into the experience of true spiritual identity. Likewise, I say it was not your honor's intention to establish emissaries of divine light as a self-perpetuating organization, but to inspire and lead people into the experience of true spiritual identity. An organization can be vital to serving that purpose. But as we well know, emissary of divine light is a functional description of personal responsibility. To be a bringer, a, a carrier, an expressor of the spirit of God on earth. Yoranda might have uh, named the church corporations. He started something like the Lucifer Legion, uh, but then that wouldn't probably have gone over very well. Far more people associate the word Lucifer with the devil than with the terms literal meaning of light bearer. A legion, by the way, is an assemblage of chosen ones. However many years ago it was when you and I began to consciously awaken, we were then in the, in the process of emerging from a, a rather material mental sense of self oriented in the world of form 
having it in us to be spiritually responsive, something we humanly speaking cannot take credit for, by the way, we felt compelled to move toward the light we saw in expression through others. The EDL organization with its leaders and communities and classes and centers and groups beautifully facilitated and hastened this awakening experience. I could not be more thankful for every little bit of my experience along the way. Spiritual education is no less important for awakening ones today, but that's another topic. Looking at our Zoom rectangles right now, we all appear to be at least somewhat senior. Most, maybe all of us, had considerable spiritual education in EDL in the past. Perhaps now in the long ago past. Pamela and I went to long class on Sunrise Ranch in 1971. 50 years ago. It's where and how and why we met, by the way. At various times, Martin likened the EDL organization to a spiritual university from which we graduate <coughs> into the real world, or as a family nest in which we are nurtured while growing into adulthood. The point has always been to come into our own. In ex an experienced identity as divine beings in human form. Within EDL, we learned love and loyalty, as Louis said in the process, coming to realize over time that it, it wasn't really loyalty to an organization as uh, to an organization as such, but to the eternal reality of God. Martin said, and Louise reiterated, I will tell you something about the past. Everything that has occurred up to this very moment has been absolutely perfect. It has brought us all to this present moment where we have the opportunity of letting the accuser be cast out. The spirit animating those words resounds in the holy place now. When, when this truth is fully accepted and, and deeply internalized, it was all perfect. Anything anyone may have felt hurt by, anything real or imagined, anyone else did or said, it all just drops away. <coughs> we may be able to recall this or that, but there is no negative emotion attached to the memory. The former things pass away. They have no place in the holy place. A while ago, I woke one morning with some loud words ringing in my mind. The Lord said, don't you dare accuse or blame my responding ones, ever. Every person who has ever has, whoever has or had the, <coughs> the quality of heart to hear the tone of life and be drawn to it is precious to the Lord beyond words to describe. All these extraordinary ones who, who live and, and breathe in, in human bodies form a legion of angels on earth. 
angels the Lord has sent, as it's put, with a great sound of a trumpet. And they, and we are among the they, gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. We are among those who have been gathered, yes. But being an emissary of divine light involves much more than that. We are also sent to gather more elect. Uh, by that, I don't imply going out and holding public meetings. The gathering is done in heaven. The Lord's compelling invitation happens mostly in and then out through our hearts. We cannot be gatherers of the Lord's most precious ones if we still harbor the accuser. For you and me, the gathering together that we are ordained to do begins with our fellow gatherees. <laughs> this diverse legion composed of every person ever associated with EDL, for starters. Oh, uh-oh. Some might think among the, that group are people I never liked or who did things I didn't approve of. Well, isn't it time to say, so what? To those accusations and and focus on what's so now yeah it is <laughs> what therefore god hath joined together let not man put asunder <laughs> that verse from mark we usually associate the quote the quote with with wedding ceremonies but it has far larger meaning too this holy legion that God hath drawn together on earth. Let not him accusing men and women put us under. Maybe we used to think of the more conscious part of that legion as being EDL. And while that was true, it was never solely EDL, was it? Let's ask ourselves, Am I less conscious today than I was back in the past? <laughs> I bet most of us would profess to be more conscious now, right? The, the accuser may have seemed sly and subtle back along the way. But as the accusing habit is purged from our hearts, we see how gross and dark that whole state is, and we judge it not, nor one another. Noting the time, it is time for any and all who wish to add to the conversation to do so. You are most warmly invited. Thank you, Louise and John. Something obvious, and everyone, <laughs> because something has obviously been happening during this time, because I don't know about you, but my, my thoughts and my feelings have definitely been activated in this substance. So I really thank everyone for that. I was thinking about radiation response and I was also thinking about the angel and the facilities and how those two dichotomies come into union as one. And it got me thinking, what is it that response responds? Who is 
responsing. What is responsing, responding? And it occurred to me that as an individual, for instance, the very atoms and molecules of this physical package called me that I've picked up for this incarnation, that is actually what is responding. So what did those moving molecules and atoms, very flexible, can configure in many ways, what did it respond to? And I would say that initially we all had the experience of responding to an external point who was in union. They, the, that person was in union. They had a particular heaven. And when I responded to that, I came into union with that one and in union with a heaven. You could call that a server, you could call it a whatever. And that union immediately activates a whole network of similarly attuned beings. It lights up and that's when we experience a larger heaven. Now we can connect with all sorts of different levels. We could join the Boy Scouts, you know, or, born, or a political party and come into union with a particular heaven. And that might be just fine. But eventually, I think there will be a longing on the, on the part of the angel here who's burning so that those capacities that it has can come into union with another heaven. And I think that's what happened to us. We came into union with a very specific heaven. Part of it was the Boy Scouts. Part of it was an earthly organization, a very useful organization of parts that were moving people moving, reconfiguring, but there was an ultimate union that was actually behind the scenes. And that's what we've been talking about. So I have no idea how this all came into my mind this morning, but I see the um, incredible beauty of the capacity's freedom to choose with what it comes into union with. And when we do find union with the angel who we are, it activates all of you, all of the angels who you are and a much greater heaven. So kind of esoteric, but anyway, that's what I've been thinking as we've been moving together this morning. I've also, so enjoyed our time and um, loved your 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 trip you took with us, Louise, down memory lane. Um, I was at Four Ways um, also when that service was given. I had just touched into the emissary ministry, and I um, was elected to um, babysit James Maskell. Um, when Rupert and Tessa were visiting. <laughs> um, and, you know, just in light of um, what has already been said, I was thinking that how amazing that the Bible starts in the beginning was the word, or maybe it's John, I can I always get that wrong, you know, but in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Today, I feel that's what we have experienced. We've experienced the word um, and we love the word and the word has a resonance to it, which is so distinct, which has called us and woken us up and drawn all things to remembrance. Um, 
so you know for me i feel just um so privileged to be a south african and here we were in 1984 at one level of the spiral now thank god for the truth the word that we love i feel that we have ascended I wouldn't say considerably, but somewhat. <laughs> um, I left South Africa um, in 1985. I was attending a one week class at Four Ways and a friend of mine called and said, Millie, I need help delivering a yacht from Cape Town to Fort Lauderdale. I said, I'm there. I said I'm there because I knew that Yorunder and Martin's ministry was focused in the United States and there was going to be nothing that stopped me. So Louise, our hearts burned as one. <laughs> but that spirit, that South African spirit, I delighted in it this past week when all the trauma happened in South Africa and my family were very much in the thick of it because all their WhatsApps and phone calls and you know messages to me did not speak of the danger that was imminent, but it spoke of the spirit of union that was happening in the country of Muslims and Africans and Afrikaners and Englishmen getting together, playing bagpipes and dancing while keeping their neighborhood safe as best they could. Indomitable spirits that were more concerned to extend a current of love than to extend a current of accusation. And I felt proud of my people. Just as for me, the exquisite joy of participating where we are today now fills my heart with absolute delight that we can be one accord in one place, that the accuser of our brethren has been cast down in these days. While I was preparing to come to this gathering, the words came to my mind um, remember the song written by Martin, uh, music by Lillian, um, come and behold him. And I feel today, and in these temple of light gatherings, that we have the opportunity to come and behold him. Come and behold who? Come and behold us, Lucifer's, the light and morning star. Come and behold us because we carry the essences of our king. We extend them into our worlds and we recognize one another. We love one another because, because when we express the word of love, there is union, fusion. And so I thank you, Louise. I sh thank you, John, for this exquisite time of communion with the one who we love above all, our Lord and King, who we give expression to. Thank you. Another South African would like to speak up and speak directly to Louise, if I may, to add to this thread, because it just seems, um, Louise, I was in that class, that one week class with you at Helena's play, and I had only, um, you know, been introduced to the emissaries about a month before or something, but it, it was in that class that I had um, the awakening uh, when we heard that same audio of Yoranda. And looking back at that, I had absolutely no, um, 
no substance or consciousness to understand a word that was being said in, you know, really understand it because Rupert was very strict with us in that class, as I remember, he insisted that we take notes to keep our minds focused. And after we heard that audio, I went to Rupert almost sort of like in penance to confess that I hadn't been able to take any notes because I couldn't, it was just beyond my mind what was you know, being said. And I told Rupert, I said, all I could think of while he was speaking was, I know this voice. I've heard this voice before. And Rupert said, don't worry, Linda, no problem. He said, just relax. He said, that's the key, just relax and in, enjoy. You know, just, I'm glad you enjoyed his voice. And what I feel today that was reinitiated um, in hearing Louise's, you know, going back in history in time, in a sense, was that that hearing of Yoranda's voice specifically, um, re, or it was like hitting a gong, I guess, inside of me that has never stopped reverberating. But it, the important thing was, once it was hit in me, then it was my response. It's my responsibility to keep that sound, the tone of that sound that was, in it, you know, reawakened in me at that moment, to become louder and louder in my through my living. And I feel like that's what we've been about. Uh, as I think it was you, John, saying that we could liken maybe the EDL organization to being like a nest where we were nurtured. And I look at all of you who are here today, and so many of us, you know, uh, were nurtured in different settings over the years together. We grew up together. And I just had to add my voice today in saying that I'm so glad that so many of us are still together doing the Lord's work on earth. Thank you so much, both to Louise and to John. My question always is, how can I further the purposes of this ministry on earth? And this morning, we have done that together. We all heard coming home. And now we are opening and providing the facility for others to come home. Thank you. Thank you. I just wanted to say a word of appreciation for John and Louise for the beauty of what we shared together. The essences of the spirit that come through you are magnificent. And appreciating what has brought us all together, there was the form of the EDL ministry. And it occurred to me as I, as I look at all these panels on my Zoom screen that I may not even know any of you had it not been for the EDL ministry, I may not even have met my wife if it was not for the EDL ministry. She lived many, many thousands of miles away. And just to appreciate this compulsion that has brought us all together, the angels of heaven who acknowledge that we're angels of heaven and that we function together in this collective agreement and that this is a foundation, a foundation of heaven on earth through which others may be invited to play their part, whatever that part may be. Wherever I go each day, I see the angels of heaven. Um, I don't know how conscious they are of that, but I see them and I appreciate them at whatever level they function. And so just wanted to express my strong agreement with the beauty of what we shared today and to let this continued in our collective heavenly agreement.
Thank you, Bill, and thank you all. Louise, some final thoughts? <laughs> I'm just feeling the incredible richness and, and the um, scope of it and the threads and the, um, I guess, tapestry that's been woven over many, many years in many, many ways. Some we know of, some we don't. And uh, it feels like there's so much to say. I would love us to have another hour, but I'm thinking gratitude is probably what I have to say now. Gratitude and love. Thank you, John. We might think of some of what's been shared today as uh, relating to the past, but we haven't gone back into the past. We've brought the past into the present. It's all been perfect and it's all here now. Time and dimensional space evaporate into the present moment in which our hearts are very full with love for the Lord and love for one another. How long he has waited for a collection of people who are unashamed to be in this holy place together. Thank you all. Thank you, John and Louise. You know, I can just say we're all at home and let's abide at home now. And Louise too, I can go another hour too or, or more, but our hours ahead of us, you know, let's take note of what we shared today, the implications for ourselves individually. And we know that as we do hold fast sacred things, the world can be blessed of all the sorrows, the travesties, there's an answer and the answer comes from us. So as we hold dear these things, let's, let's hold them, let's hear them and let's do what's necessary in our hearts and minds. Our next service will be on August 22nd with Arno and Mia, another South African representative. So we look forward to that. We'll see you in a month or so.